Good morning. It is always good to be with y'all, and I'm especially excited about today. Uh, we are talking, as you've already heard today, about our vision for the next 10 years. And where this comes from is uh, back in October, the staff and I, uh, the whole ministry staff, uh, Michael wasn't here yet at that time, but uh, the rest of us got together. We went to San Antonio for our annual staff retreat. We always planned the year's ministry. This time, though, we were talking about what do we want to see, what do we believe the Lord is leading us to do as a church moving forward over the next 10 years. Uh, we, we talked about what we know about our community, the needs in our community. We talked about what we, what we know about our church, what we're good at, the resources we have, what we have to offer. We talked about the heart of God and, and what God wants to see happen based on Scripture. And, and we came up with what we believe is a vision for the next 10 years of ministry. Now, let me give you three disclaimers. First of all, Usually, in this time in the worship service, I give a biblical sermon. If this is your first time at First Baptist Church, this is not the usual thing at uh, 1126 on Sunday mornings. Usually, I get up and I read a scripture and we preach, and I preach a sermon out of that scripture that exposes the Word of God and that helps us to understand how to apply that to our lives. That's what I love doing. I, I, I love that more than anything in the world except being with my family. I mean, it... it there are lots of things about being a pastor that I get paid to do. Preaching is something I do for free. Okay, If y'all ever make me stop preaching here, I'll go preach somewhere else because I just love it. Uh, so you understand how important this is that I would give up an opportunity to preach a message of, out of the Scriptures to do something else today. Because it's so important for us as a church family to know the direction we're all trying to go and be in agreement on that. Number two, I don't know what the future holds any more than you do. In getting up here and talking about vision, I don't claim to know what the next 10 years are going to happen, what's going to happen over the next 10 years. I don't claim to have a special hotline to God that's any different than yours. We all have the same Holy Spirit inside of us if we're believers in Jesus. Um, and, and so James 4.15 says we should always be very humble when we talk about our plans, but Proverbs tells us over and over again, we should plan. We should plan ahead and, and not just go through life bumbling around and hoping something works out. Number three, my third disclaimer, if at the end of what I say today, you walk away saying, eh, it doesn't excite me, or well, that's not what I was thinking our church should do, or well, Jeff can do whatever he wants, I'm going to keep on doing what I do and, and, and not change, you know what's going to happen? Nothing. God's still going to love you the same he does right now. I'm still going to treat you the same. We're part of the same family of God because Jesus died for our sins. And that's not going to change. But I've been a pastor now for going on 24 years. And in that time, and I've been a Christian since I was nine. I'll let you do the math on how long that's been. In that time, I have never been part of a church that was more exciting to me, more, I think, resourced and positioned to make a powerful impact on its community, to change lives, to do great things. I've never been more excited to be part of a church than I am right now. And great things are going to happen here. And I believe this vision that, that I'm about to present to you is God-honoring, is scripturally based. And I think if, if, we can, if we can live this out, we're going to see a lot of lives changed for good, including ours. So, with all that said... Let me talk about where we are as a church, where we are as a community, the heart and the mission of God for us, and then what our vision is in that order. So, where we are as a church. We had a good year. 2019 was a very good year for First Baptist Church of Conroe. I, I'm not sure I've ever been in a church that's had the kind of year we had last year. Last year, we added 124 new members to our congregation, which for a church our size is very good. We also grew a lot in worship attendance. You don't need me to tell you that. You can look around and see lots of new faces on a consistent basis. That's exciting. I have people who've been members of this church for 40, 50 years, and they'll come tell me, Jeff, when I walk through the atrium or when I'm in worship, I just see so many new faces, people I don't know. It's almost like it's a brand new church. And I'm glad to say that when they say that, they're rejoicing. They're not complaining. Because in some churches it would be, I don't like all these new people. I want things to stay the same. So all of that is very, very good. It's been a very good year for us financially. We don't talk about money a lot in the church. We don't want you to think that that's why we want you here is for your money. But we do know that it takes money to do ministry. And in the past year, you gave very generously. 
In fact, we came up, we had a, a surplus at the end of the year. We had more money on hand than we intended to spend, which is a good problem to have. It enabled us to do some things we weren't planning to do, like power wash the outside of the church building uh, and, and pay down some of our debt. Speaking of debt, if you're new to our church, you may not know this, but several years ago, this church went through a building process, a renovation process. They, they redid the gym and the youth area, student area and children's area. A lot of new, uh, a lot of work to, to equip us to reach next generations, which I think was very great, but it left us with a significant amount of debt. So two years ago, we, we started a, a, a program called the For the Missions or for the mission uh, campaign, and, and at that time we had $1.7 million in debt, which meant that every week, every month, we had to pay $12,000 toward that debt, and that, that, that would continue on in, into perpetuity. Well, I'm glad to tell you that today our debt is $315,000. $1.7 $315,000. So you can do the math there too, right? A lot, I don't know who's been given, but a lot of people have been giving very generously over and above. Yes, over and above what it takes to do ministry and, and operate the church on a regular basis. And that means that if we continue doing that, then we're going to be debt free this year. And it's going to be exciting to be debt free, but I'm even more excited about the fact that suddenly we'll have $12,000 a month that we'll be able to use on ministry instead of debt service. So good things happening. And then there's all the things you can't measure in numbers. Now this is all subjective. This is just my opinion, but I think a lot of you share this opinion. There's just a lot of really great people in this church. And, and I tell you that because this is where I work. And a lot of you work in places where you're around toxic people and people you can barely stand. And I'm glad to tell you, I get to work and serve alongside people I love. And I don't just love, I like. There's a lot of really great people here. It, it, it seems like every day I, I, I encounter one of you and I, I walk away thinking, thank God that person's in my life. This is a welcoming church. People who've joined in the past couple of years keep telling me, everybody here is so nice to me. Can we do better? Absolutely. Are we united? Yes. Can we love each other more? You bet. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday. In fact, that's what Disciple Now is about next weekend. So be praying for our students in that. Outreach is increasing in this church. Any church that's more than four or five years old just tends to grow more inwardly focused. And we're fighting against that as a, as a church that's 128 years old. We know we have to go to battle against that tendency every day. And so you see programs constantly being started to help us get out into the community. Last year, we adopted Sam Houston Elementary School, which is just two blocks away. And, and is a church that need, uh, is a school that needs help. A lot of really good teachers, great families there. They just need resources. They need people to come alongside them. And that's what we're trying to do. That's gotten started. We're going to expand that as time goes on. Uh, every week, 80 plus people learn English as a second language through a ministry that we have called Literacy First. And many volunteers in this room make that happen. There's not a single paid staff member that runs that. That's a volunteer-led organization, pro program. There are other outreach programs and ministries we have in this church, too many to mention, but you're part of those. And that makes me excited. That makes me excited to be part of this church. That stuff's only increasing. By the way, I think it's also really cool that last year we had mission trips that took the gospel to New Orleans, Vancouver, Costa Rica, Colombia, and England. Just last year. Now let me tell you about something that is an indication we're still not there yet. Right? All this good stuff I'm excited about, but of the 124 people that joined our church last year, only 22 joined by baptism. Almost all of them came by a letter from another church or by statement of faith. And those 22 people, because I'm the pastor, I happen to know not all of those were new believers in Jesus. Some of those were just coming over from different Christian traditions who'd never been baptized as a believer in Christ. Now, if you joined our church in the last year, we're so thankful you're here. I don't mean to say that people who join by other means other than baptism are not valuable because they are. I, I've met and gotten to know the people who've joined our church and they're wonderful people and they've already made us a better church. If you moved here from another town and you, you decided this is where I want to make my spiritual home and I want to partner with this group of people, hallelujah, that's wonderful. It's, it's the tendency these days to move and just never go to church. So that's a win for the kingdom. If you joined here from another church here in town, we're thankful to have you. You've blessed us. Your, your resources, your gifts, your, 
your, uh, your calling is going to make us a stronger church. But our gain was the loss of another church. You understand? Our joy at, at receiving you was the sorrow of the church you left. And that's not how we want to grow in the future. I hope that next year when I get up here and give a talk like this, it's going to be something about, yeah, we gained a lot of new members this year, and most of them were through baptism. Most of them were people coming to know Christ for the very first time, or people who've wandered away and left church behind, but now they've come home back to Jesus. That should be our mission. That should be our goal. That's one thing you, and you can join with me in praying for, that we would be that kind of church. So that's where we are as a church. Now let's talk about our community. I found this interesting when I was doing research for this. In 2007, the Houston Chronicle wrote an article in which they called Conroe, and I quote, a sleepy semi-rural town. That's 2007. It's not sleepy and it's not semi-rural anymore. If you've lived here a long time, if you grew up here, that probably makes you a little bit sad that it's changed so much. But it, this, is what, this is where we live. This is, this is the environment, the, the reality of Conroe today. Put it this way, um, in 2010, beginning of the last decade, Conroe had a population of 36,000. Today it's 87,000. That happened in a decade. Between 2015 and 2018, Conroe was the fastest growing city in all of America. And the population of Montgomery County is projected to double by 2040. That's 20 years from now. To over 1 million people. Now that's a lot of people who are moving to our area. Why are they moving here? Well, they're moving here because they're looking for the good life and they think they're going to find it here. They're looking for more house for their money. They're looking for better schools for their kids. They're looking for safer neighborhoods. They're looking for a, a little quieter pace. And they're finding those things. It's, it's good to live in a place that people want to move to, isn't it? But the good life isn't as easy to find as simply buying a house on the lake or putting some Instagram pictures of your family on social media. The good life is elusive. And so when you look at our neighbors and you look at the carefully, you look behind the carefully crafted exterior of their lives, what you see is chaos. That's the word. When we as a, a staff met and prayed and talked about our community and our neighbors and our families and our friends and even our church members. That's the word we kept coming back to was chaos. We see divorce tearing apart families. We see marriages that are holding on but only by a thread. The love has gone out of them a long time ago and they're just hanging on for dear life. We see parents who are providing their kids with so much stuff, so many opportunities, so much attention, and yet those kids still struggle with bullying, with anxiety, with depression, hopelessness, despair, and more than anything else, loneliness. Loneliness is the word we keep coming back to, we keep reading about, we keep seeing. We've never been more connected as a, as a human race than we are today, and yet we've never felt more alone. So many people I know who don't even have one person that they call a real friend, one person they feel like they can count on. In all that chaos, some people think, well, I just need to work harder. I just need to earn more money. I just need to spend more hours at the office. I need to earn another degree. But that's just, that's just doing the same thing and expecting different results, which is the definition of insanity, right? Some people devolve into addictive behaviors, and that's happening more and more and more in our culture. And some people go even further than that. You know, some of you are aware, but most of you probably aren't. A man took his own life right before Christmas just a few yards from where I'm standing, over there by the train tracks, just steps away from our church, put a gun to his chest and, and took his own life. How many of our neighbors are right at the point uh, of making that same tragic choice? Well, what can we do? What is God's heart for people who are lost in chaos? What is God's heart for our community? And what is our mission to come alongside him? Well, we kept talking about that word chaos and then, and then I did some research and, and the word chaos our English word chaos comes from the Greek word that means chasm or void, which is interesting because the second verse in the whole Bible, Genesis 1-2, which I'm going to preach on two weeks from today, it starts by saying, in the beginning when God created the heavens and earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And then God came in and said, let there be light. And then we see that process of creation. So what we see is God came into chaos 
and made order out of it. God came into chaos and made peace. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. Shalom doesn't just mean an end to uh, war or violence. Shalom means prosperity. It means thriving. It means everything is set right and life is enjoyable again. God does that. That's His business. That's His full-time occupation, bringing peace, shalom to the chaos that is in our lives. And then we, we read in John chapter 1, this is, this is what we spent our, our weeks before Christmas on. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What that tells us is that when God looked down on a world that was full of chaos, He didn't send a care package. He didn't send money. He didn't put up a billboard that said, God loves you. He came Himself in the flesh. God didn't even have flesh. He took on flesh. So he could come and invest in us personally. He didn't send someone else. He sent himself. And then we see, and by the way, he didn't just come and knock on our door and give a canned sales pitch. He came and died for us so we could be saved. That's the gospel. Second Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That verse is about the Holy Spirit. And what it's saying is, The more time you spend in the presence of Jesus, the more time you spend beholding His glory or looking at Him, the more you start to look like Him. I don't mean physically. I mean from the inside out, you start to have His joy, His peace, His righteousness, His courage, His compassion. Those things start to show in you. You start to reflect His glory to everyone around you. So what's our job? Our mission is to follow His example. Just like Jesus didn't stay in heaven and say, boy, it sure would be nice if the world would get its act together. He came and got involved. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why what we do here on Sunday morning, y'all listen to me. Listen to what I'm about to say. What we do here on Sunday morning is not the point. You understand that, right? The victory, this is not the finish line. You know, right now we've got about 800 people coming to worship on Sunday mornings, which is great. And if we, if we got it to 1,200 in a couple of years, hallelujah. But that's not the point. Far better to have 800 people who are fulfilling the mission of Jesus than 1,200 or 12,000 who are coming and enjoying a show and going home unchanged. Our mission is to do what Jesus did and become the glory of God incarnate in the lives of the people who are lost in chaos. To bring peace to them in the name of Christ as only He can do as He chooses to do in us. Our job is to be to reflect God's glory to those who see it. See, one of the things we, when we were thinking of what our vision should be, here's, here's what we came up with. We, we started thinking, okay, so we're in downtown Conroe, right? We're right in the middle of the city. We're the only major church in the middle of the city like that. That means we don't have a particular neighborhood that's quote unquote our mission field. We, we're not the church of Greystone or the church of Pandora or, or uh, Panorama. We're not, the church of, uh, we're not the church of Woodland Hills or Grand Central or RP, or whatever you want to name. We're the church of Conroe. We're the church of Montgomery County. This whole area is our mission field. And what do we have to offer them? Well, I think we've got some pretty good buildings. I'm thankful for them. But that's not our main resource. I think our programs are pretty nice. I I think Nathan and and Robert do an excellent job leading worship. Our life groups are fantastic. Student ministry is great. Children's ministry is top-notch. Great. But None of that really matters to people who are lost in chaos. I got news for you. Someone whose marriage is ending, someone whose house is about to be be repossessed, somebody who's just about ready to end it all, they're not sitting there saying, you know, if only I could find a place with comfortable pews and a nice sermon. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for someone to come into their life and bring peace to their chaos. Looking for one of us. See, that's our number one resource. You are the best resource this church has, aside from the Holy Spirit itself. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you've been following Jesus for more than five years. Okay? Keep it up if it's been more than 10 years. 20? 30? 40? 
Anybody more than 50? Wow. Did you see the hands? I mean, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of time spent in the presence of Jesus. According to 2 Corinthians 3.18, that's a lot of people who've grown to look and act and think a whole lot more like Jesus than they would have been otherwise. So in other words, that's a lot of the bread of life, a lot of the water of life under one roof, which makes me a very lucky pastor. But if that's all it is, if we're hoarding the bread of life while the community's out there starving for it, then we're monsters. We're not a church. We're a club. And a really bad one at that. Our job is to take that living water, that, that bread of life to those who need it, to bring peace to their chaos. That's our job. And, and by the way, I'm not talking about a door-to-door -door evangelism. If this was 15, 20 years ago, and we were having the same talk, we'd, my, my vision would probably be, okay, every Tuesday night we're going to gather, we're going to go knocking on doors, and we're going to share the gospel, and I'm going to train you how to share the gospel, and here's how you're going to do it, which is fine. That's how a lot of us came to faith. The problem is, the culture's changed. The gospel hasn't, but the culture has. And so people don't necessarily want to know what the Bible says about salvation. They don't accept the Bible's authority. If you come to them and say, do you want to know what the Bible says about how to get to heaven? They'll say, eh, not really. And by the way, people no longer like someone coming to their house unannounced, uninvited, and giving them a prepared presentation. Any of you who've ever done door-to-door -door sales know that's the truth. So again, if God has called you to a ministry of cold call evangelism, I don't want to discourage you. You do what God's called you to do. I'm just telling you, it doesn't work today for churches like it used to. Today, before someone will hear the gospel from you, most, for the most part, they need to have a relationship with you first. They need to know something about your life. They need to see something in you they don't see in the rest of the world. Because they've already decided, most of them, what they think Christians are. And we have to show them what the Scripture says we are. We have to show them before we can tell them. And that's why here's our vision. Our vision is over the next 10 years, the people of First Baptist Conroe will be involved in 10,000 transforming relationships, watching God use us to bring peace to the chaos, one heart, one family at a time. Get used to that language because you're going to be hearing it a lot. 10,000 transforming relationships. What do I mean by transforming relationships? Because some of you might be saying, okay, well, I can help with that because I got five members of my family. I got three friends that I eat lunch with once a week, two guys I play golf with. That's 10. That's, that's like 1%, one, 1 right? Or 0.1%. Or no, that's not what we're talking about. What we're counting is transforming relationships have two criteria. Number one, they need to be intentional. In other words, not, some, not a relationship you already had, but something you chose to invest in because of Jesus. Or a relationship you already had, but you chose to take it in a different direction. Like, yeah, that used to be the guy I just played golf with. Now he's the guy who I'm helping him with his issues with his kids. Or, yeah, that lady used to be the one that I ate lunch with once a week. Now she's the person who I pray with and do a Bible study once a week. Intentional. Secondly, they need to be based on a need, focused on a need. So, for example, you start invite, you and your family start inviting your elderly neighbor over to dinner once a week because you see that she rarely gets out of the house and nobody ever seems to visit. You're like, this lady has got to be lonely. We, we can be the family to her that no one else will be. Uh, you, you start helping your young coworker because she's just swamped in debt, and you sit down with her and say, okay, I'm going to help you with a budget. I'm good at that sort of thing. You help her work out a budget. You help her stay, stick to it and help her move her life forward. Um, you get involved in prison ministry. There are several members of our, of our church who are, and you don't just go. You end up, you end up uh, mentoring a particular prisoner and praying with him every time you go and praying and, and helping him get ready for life on the outside to start life all over again. You meet for coffee with a single mom and you sit and you listen to her and you let her vent about all her issues and all her frustrations. You give her advice when there's advice to give. You help out at, at times. You keep her kids for her so she can get a few things done or just get a break. See, in all these things, you're helping someone 
with a need, and you're doing it in Jesus' name. And that's a start, and that's how we build those relationships that lead to transformation. Somewhere along the lines, they're going to ask you why. Somewhere along the lines, you're going to have an opportunity to talk to them about what Christ has done for you. And that's how lives get changed these days. And we're going to see that happen over the next 10 years at least 10,000 times. Can you imagine if 10,000 different people have contact with people in this church who are intentional and focused on that person's need and they're doing it in the name of Jesus and they're bathing it in prayer? Can you imagine the impact that's going to have on our community? 10,000 people. I'm not saying all 10,000 are going to come to know Christ through our church, but we're going to bring them closer to faith. And some of them will get baptized in that baptistry right back there. And some of them will come back to the Lord who've given up on church and have given up on Christianity entirely. And we're going to see our community start to look at us differently and say, well, I don't know. I still not sure. I mean, Baptist, really? But listen, those people have shown me something. They've made our community a better place. They obviously love us. So there must be something about their God. So how will we accomplish this? How will we reach this goal? Well, three things. Number one, we're going to talk about it a lot. We're going to hear about this basically every Sunday and often in between. If you follow me on social media, and many of you are, you're going to hear this during the week from me. We need to talk about this. We need this to be embedded in our DNA. This this is what I mean by that. I I want this over over the next 10 years and and sooner than that, I want this to become something that you identify with. So that when you think about yourself as a member of First Baptist Church, it's not, yeah, I'm a member of First Baptist, so I go to this life group, or I'm a member of First Baptist, so I go to this worship service. No, it's, I'm a member of First Baptist, so I have a relationship with this person over here. And that's what I go to church for. I go to church to to equip myself, to get myself encouraged and equipped and ready to relate to this person and this person and this person. And that's what it means for me to be a part of First Baptist Church. Because we're a church that takes the glory of God to those who need it. Second thing, second thing we're going to be doing is we're going to create openings for these kinds of relationships. Because right now, I'm sure a lot of you are sitting there saying, okay, I, I get what you're trying to say, Jeff. I just don't know how to take the next step. Well, that's, that's my job. That's what me, what I and the rest of the ministry staff will be working on uh, full time for the next 10 years is we're going to keep creating opportunities and openings to say, okay, if you fall into this category, here's a way for you to meet people over here and to relate to them. Give you some examples. These aren't things we're starting yet, but things that we've brainstormed. I see a day and hopefully soon when we'll have mentor couples have relationships. So a couple who's in a healthy and stable marriage will will come alongside a couple who maybe just got married or maybe they've been married a while and they're struggling and those mentor couples will hang out together and and the the stronger couple will will strengthen the weaker couple and and, and strengthen that marriage and encourage them and bring peace to their chaos. Uh, Last year, some of you knew, uh, two years ago, when we went through the missional pathway, this church said... We're going to adopt our city government. We're going to relate to, we're going to partner with our leaders in downtown Conroe, city government and county government. We're going to see how we can strengthen and minister to them. We don't know what that looks like yet, but maybe part of it this year will be us reaching out to people individually. You could find yourself in a life group that says, we've adopted this department of our city or county government. We're going to pray for them and we're going to seek opportunities to bless them. And that could lead to transforming relationships I think about the fact that as our church grows, we're going to need more leaders. We're going to need more people to lead life groups. We're going to need more people to serve in various ways. And so we're going to create a leadership pipeline so that people who are presently serving in leadership positions find themselves mentoring and equipping someone who's younger in the faith to come and come alongside them and work as a student ministry volunteer or a children's ministry volunteer or a life group leader or an usher or, or whatever the case may be. So those are examples of openings will create over time to give you those opportunities. But third, the third way we're going to get there is we need to track these transforming relationships. We need to come up with a way of knowing the kinds of relationships you're involved in. Because face it, some of you are already doing this. Like I said, there are 15 people mentoring on the campus of Sam Houston Elementary once a week, sitting down with with a child and having lunch with them and, and being involved in their lives. There are others of you who are mentoring on other campuses. And those are transforming relationships. That's exactly what we're talking about. We need to count those. 
Some of you are mentor moms through mothers of preschoolers. So you're pouring into the lives of younger moms. That's a transforming a relationship right there. Some of you are doing this and there's not a name for it. You've just decided, I'm going to take care. I'm going to, I'm going to relate to this coworker, this friend, this neighbor, this younger person, this person who's struggling. We need to know about those so we can count them. So we know the impact our church is making on its community. So what comes next? Well, this year our ministry theme is His Story, Your Story. So all through this year, I'm going to be telling stories. I'm going to be preaching uh, uh, sermons that, that talk about stories in Scripture of how God changed people's lives. Meanwhile, James is going to be putting together story after story of First Baptist Church members and these kinds of transforming relationships they've had in their past or they have going on right now. And so you'll watch them on the screen and you'll see, oh, this is already going on. And it'll, it'll whet your appetite. It'll get you excited. It'll make you think, number one, man, I remember when someone invested in my life and how much poorer I would be if that hadn't happened. But number two, you'll be thinking, you know, I can do that. And the Holy Spirit will be putting names in front of you. Give this person a phone call. Sit down with this guy. Go out to lunch with this lady. That's our goal for this year. That's our hope for you. So we as a staff, we're going to be doing the three things I talked about before, talking this up, uh, creating openings, tracking the relationships, but we're also going to be preparing for growth. Our church, like I said, has grown a lot in the last year. We anticipate future growth. And that means... We need to be ready. We need to, if you know people are coming over to your house, the, the smart thing to do is prepare the way, right? You clean, you clean your, your, your junk off the kitchen table and you get things ready to, to serve them. We need to be ready for the people God's going to bring to us. So I know I'm about to say something that's going to create a lot of questions, but I'm going to say it anyway. We are right now planning and preparing to start a third worship service and a second life group hour this year. I don't know any details yet. I know you've got questions. I just dropped a bomb on you and you're like, wait a second, what does that look like? What's it going to be? When's it going to be? Where am I? I don't know yet. I just, I'm just telling you, that's what we're planning and preparing for because we need to be ready for the growth God is going to bring to our church. So here's what I do know. You want to know something I'm certain of? If Jesus doesn't come back first, 2030 is going to be here before you know it. I know it sounds a long way off, but it's not. And more importantly than that, our community and the people who are struggling right now in chaos of various kinds, the people who are lonely, the people who are depressed, people who are struggling, families that are falling apart, they can't wait for us to sit around deciding what to do. And they're not just going to stumble into our church saying, tell me what I should do. We have to go to them. We have to relate to them. The people of this community need to know that the heart of Jesus is at the heart of our community. And He cares about them. He loves them. Listen, the thing I'm describing isn't anything new. We're not innovators. This is what we should have been doing all along. And some of you have been. It's just changing the focus of the church from the point is to get as many people as possible under one roof. To go from that mentality to the point is that the people who come need to be equipped to go out there. The point of what we do is what happens Monday through Saturday, not what happens Sunday. That's what I know for sure. And here's what I know for sure. Beyond that, the most important thing I know of all, there's probably some people in this room who would say, when you talk about chaos, you're talking about my life. I'm struggling with chaos. I'm struggling with confusion and disorder and desperation and depression and anxiety. And if that's you, if I just described you, here's what I know. When we were all lost, when chaos described the life of every person here, when it was as though we were over here and God and His love and His joy and His peace were over there and between us there was this huge chasm full of boiling, churning death, what did Jesus do? He threw Himself into the chasm. Why? Because His body became the bridge that we walked across to get to salvation. That's what He did for you. His only reward was you. And so, if your life is characterized by confusion and disorder, discouragement, hopelessness, loneliness, come to Him. 
because that is the ultimate transforming relationship.